Ba 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 Superman is by Ba 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 He sucks dick now Okay, okay, sorry. Jokes aside, last week the entire internet got in a huge hubbub because turns out Superman, the hero that stands for truth, justice, and the American way, will be revealed to be bisexual in an upcoming issue of his comic releasing next month in November. DC Comics announced the news for the iconic hero on October 11th, fittingly coming out day. And sadly, because everything today has to be caught up in our culture war, from toilet paper to fictional character sexuality, a lot of people had a lot of things to say online. This is unnecessary. If DC Comics wanted to include LGBTQ so bad, they should have created a whole new character with its own storyline. Not use an old one. Leave Superman alone. Uh... A bisexual Superman? WTF? Is this really necessary? The answer, it's not. Superman is not bisexual. Now, we've all been here before when it comes to pop culture. Oh God, they made Robin bisexual. That was only a few months ago. Or, oh God, they made a 007 black in the last Bond movie and also a woman. Oh God, they slightly referenced that Loki was gender fluid. Oh God, they made Doctor Who a woman. Oh God, they made gay folks in Star Trek. Oh God, they have Heimdall being black in the first Thor movie. This type of conversation around fictional characters has been going on for years and years and years now. And it all generally usually turns out to be fine. It's all fine. That, I mean, sometimes the things are good, sometimes the things are bad, but like, that's irregardless of the fact that the characters were a different identity than they were shown in other versions of that character. But there are a lot of conversations to be had about that and what that means. But what I found most interesting this time when it came to bisexual Superman was who was getting in on the conversation. Most notably, politicians. Here's a good example from an Arizona state senator. Superman loves Lewis. <laughs> Lane, not Lois, Lewis. Period. Hollywood is trying to make Superman gay, and he is not. Just rename the new version Thooperman so we can all know the difference and avoid seeing it. Not only was it politicians, but almost every major news channel and site from Fox News to CNN was getting in on this conversation. And this has been happening more and more over the past few years, with big news sites and politicians and news broadcasts talking about the sexuality of pop culture characters. It seems kind of weird, right? And so I kind of want to analyze with Bisexual Superman why? Why are politicians and news channels who focus on, you know, actual news, so ready to jump on the conversation around the sexuality of superheroes around pop culture? Well, let's talk about it. Hey, but before we get to the meat of this video, let's quick talk about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators where you can explore new skills, learn how to better approach your passions, and build your creativity. Personally, y'all, I actually really, really love Skillshare, and a class that has been kind of really helpful for me lately is Roxane Gay's Creative Writing, Crafting Personal Essays with Impact. Now, being honest, Roxane Gay is one of my favorite writers just in general, especially in nonfiction. I mean, I'm a bisexual trans woman. They basically, as soon as you come out, just hand you a copy of Bad Feminist and say, go forth, young queer person, be free, be free. <laughs> but seriously, you know, I have no choice but to stand Roxanne. Ooh. Stan Roxanne, that's kind of fun. Jokes aside though, as many of you know, most of my videos are really deeply personal essays that use my experiences and learning journeys to make larger points about societal and political issues, and that's a style that Roxanne Gay is undoubtedly the master of. And so her class was extremely helpful for me to be able to hone that writing style, and I cannot recommend it enough, especially if you like writing and especially if you're a nonfiction writer. Basically, she helps you write good. I mean, she doesn't help with the grammar part of it, but, you know, with the structure of your writing. But I'm sure no matter what, Skillshare will have a class for you. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and there are always new premium classes being offered. So you can stay focused and keep finding new ways to expand your creativity. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of premium membership. And by doing so, you also help me out as well. So it's, you know, kind of a win, 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 win. And, and Ro Roxanne Gay! Roxanne Gay! But thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and with all that said, let's get back to the video. Alright, now that we're back from the ad, before we get to the politicians of it all, I want to first look at what the arguments against a bisexual Superman are. Because, 
If you're new to this channel, what I like to do here is try to take arguments, even ones made in bad faith, and talk about them in as good a faith way as possible. Not just really for their own sake, but because I think trying to tackle the arguments from that lens help us illuminate why the argument is often so appealing to folks who do listen to it and think the argument is good, even if the original argument was made in bad faith or had an agenda behind it. So let's come into this with a good faith lens and listen to what some people are saying about bisexual Superman specifically. And I also should say, while we are going to be focusing in on bisexual Superman, a lot of this conversation is repetitious of things that have been said about all these types of characters. So I'm just using this as a specific work case example to discuss this trend as a whole. And we'll get to what I think that trend is towards the end of the video. But let's start talking about bisexual Superman with this clip from Fox News. That, com that comes after a gay Aquaman, a bisexual boy wonder, Robin, and a gender fluid Loki. Call me when they have a gender stable aisle with superheroes whose sexual we know nothing about. Why are they sexualizing superheroes? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a lot to talk about there. And it's, I'll be honest, it's going to be a little bit hard to good faith this one. And I will have some other examples. I'm not going to just use this guy to straw man it, but I think he articulates a lot of what the core of this conversation about bisexual Superman is. And there's a lot of stuff in his statement that I find to be a little bit, honestly, kind of repugnant. And We'll get to that in a second, even if we're talking about this in good faith. But let's start outright with stuff that we can sort of glean from how he's talking about a bisexual Superman and talk about it in a way that is sort of removed from the more uh, repugnant aspects of what he was saying. One argument that this guy brings up that many others have, not just him, is why do they need to change our heroes, our heroes, like Superman? I mean, even the Arizona state senator kind of got at this in her tweet. Superman's story has always been defined by him loving Lois Lane, for example. That's the great love story of comics. Well, here's the first thing with that argument when it comes to this specific bisexual Superman. Clark Kent, Superman, the Superman that we all know and love, he still exists and is still married to Lois Lane. In fact, even within the canon where Superman is coming out as bisexual, the Superman that came out as bisexual is not the one that's married to Lois Lane. And by the way, it should be stated that Superman being bisexual wouldn't negate him still being able to go out and see Lois Lane. But regardless, the Superman that actually came out as bisexual in the comics is John Kent, Superman's son, who has currently taken on the mantle of Superman in one of these spin-off titles. So no, Superman hasn't changed, you still have your straight heterosexual buff Superman Clark Kent. Hell, there's still many ongoing comics with him in it, and there's still an ongoing movie series, kind of, maybe, with uh, Henry Cavill as Superman, and a TV show on HBO Max that literally is about Clark Kent fucking enemies and fighting Lois Lane. I think I... I think I screwed up the order there, but you get what I'm trying to say. And I think it's partially telling that so many people have framed this conversation absent of that context around this bisexual Superman being not Clark Kent, but his son. And I think there are two major reasons for this. The first being news media kind of wants to get clicks. Like the headline that says Superman comes out as bisexual will get a lot more engagement and clicks than the headline that says Superman's way less popular son John Kent who most people have never even heard of comes out as bisexual in the Superman spin-off series that most people haven't read yet. One of those will tend to get a lot more clicks than the other one. And so some people's anger about this change to Superman the hero is misinformation intentionally started by websites trying to get clicks for profit because we all know that the news media online is struggling at this point to get people to clicks and any way they can do that is a way to do that you know justified or no but I think that would be a little bit too simple of an answer to that question because I do think that there are some people who have a vested interest in making people angry about this. And so obfuscating who the actual Superman that is becoming bisexual is, is being weaponized for anger. That these people want to get folks angry about the subject, so making it seem to be about Clark Kent, the Superman that we already know, is more beneficial to them. Now, who, why, and how this is happening is something I will get into later on in this video. So just keep that in the back of your mind for a minute here, we'll be coming back to it. But again, let's take this argument in as good a faith way as we possibly can and steel man it. What if Superman, Clark Kent, the Clark Kent that we've known for years and decades and almost 100, I think actually 100 years at this point, what if that Clark Kent did come out as bisexual? I mean, this isn't the first time this issue has come up. I mean, some folks were recently talking about the next James Bond possibly being a woman. And Bond actor Daniel Craig, a man I respect, had this to say about it. There should simply be better parts for women and actors of color. Why should a woman play James Bond when there should be a part just as good as James Bond, but for a woman? So with this Bond argument, we see the same sort of thing happening with 
with what people are arguing about with Superman. That to change James Bond to being a woman or a person of color would somehow change the character in some fundamental way. And his argument is, is to not necessarily change the character, but to create other characters who are just as good as James Bond. To be fair, I entirely agree with him in many respects. There should be more characters written for women, written for actors of color, written for LGBTQ folks in general that are just as popular and good as James Bond. That we should have more parts written for folks who have been underrepresented for years and decades and centuries at this point that have just as much thoughtful writing, directing, given as just as much marketing, given as just as much media hype and clout as characters like Superman or James Bond. That's something that I 100% definitely want. I don't want to get rid of James Bond or Superman or the versions of them that I've come to know and love, but I would like to see more different characters that represent the totality of the human experience. And to be fair, while it's nowhere where it needs to be, we are starting to see more heroes and mainstream characters become big that are from marginalized groups like Black Panther, Shang-Chi, or Harley Quinn. And again, it's not as far as it needs to be, but it is starting to happen, most definitely, and that is awesome. The issue is, these characters sadly don't often get as much attention, don't get as much focus because they don't have the history, they don't have the clout that comes with a character like James Bond. Most women-led action movies and superhero films were often given less marketing, less thoughtful attention to the writing, less budget than their male counterparts. But even then, sometimes, in this world where everything needs to be part of a big block blockbuster franchise in order to get some form of attention, creating new characters, even if they get all the same marketing and budget and all that stuff, doesn't bring enough attention to them. And so, sometimes, changing a character is a way to help bring important representation by using characters that we already know. This has already happened numerous times in comics for decades now. For example, did you know that Captain Marvel was originally a dude in the comics, but eventually handed the mantle over to a woman, Carol Danvers? And now, Carol Danvers is the most popular incarnation of the character, so much so that most people don't even remember the male Captain Marvel. And she was the first woman character to be centered in a huge Marvel movie and became one of the most popular women characters in that franchise. And this is incredibly important because it gave important representation to women in superhero dumb. <laughs> superhero dumb? You get what I mean both in the comics when it originally happened and in movies when she came to the big screen, being the first woman in a over 20 movie franchise to feature a woman as the titular character. And that might not have happened had the character stayed a guy. We might have had to wait longer in comics for a big woman character. We might have had to wait longer for a big MCU woman to get on the big screen. Even further, beyond just the representation real life angle, I think there's also an artistic angle to be looking at this conversation through as well. Changing a character's gender or sexuality or, you know, ethnicity can bring entirely new dimensions to the character, adding interesting depths or new layers or avenues to explore with the character. For example, one of my favorite science fiction shows of all time, Battlestar Galactica, changed the genders of the characters Boomer and Starbuck to women from their initial incarnations. And it added so many different storylines for both of those characters, and it easily made them the standout characters of the show. There are things that those versions of the characters could only do because they were women. And so I found that to be entirely interesting that that change happened. They were still core to those characters and who they were, and yet they were also given new depths and layers and avenues to explore because they were now women. So I asked this question, what would it mean for 007, the typically womanizing sex-focused spy, to be a woman now? What does that reveal about the character? What does that say about what James Bond or Jane Bond could be? Fictional characters are fictional characters. They are just that, and as such, they are meant to change with the times. They are meant to be malleable and explore different avenues and different ideas. But again, I do get it. Some people are invested in certain versions of their favorite characters, and I get that you, possibly out there watching this, don't want your favorite character to change. I mean, I understand if you're a big Superman fan and you're also a straight guy, and so seeing him come out as bisexual or another character you love changing gender may feel like it's alienating you from your favorite character. I totally understand and get that. I, I can understand why you would be bothered or worried about that. However, what I would ask you to do is to think about a few things, to analyze why you're uncomfortable. First, the old stories that you fell in love with about that character still exist. You can still go back and find them and find inspiration in them. Secondly, I also ask you why, why not try and see if this new version of the character works come into it with an open mind. There will always, always be more Superman stories featuring the straight Clark Kent. So why not see what a bisexual Superman can bring to the character, even if that story fails? Now we've had a chance to explore that, to see what a bisexual Superman would mean. 
Why limit what fiction can be when fiction is about breaking limitations of reality or exploring issues from our reality in new ways? But thirdly, and I think most importantly, what I ask you to think about is, what about folks who haven't gotten a chance to be inspired by Superman in the way that you have by being able to relate to him because you share the same identity? You may have seen yourself in Superman, but there are also a lot of straight dude superheroes out there for you to identify with, and so few LGBTQ ones. For some folks out there, seeing a young bisexual Superman will mean a lot to them, just in the same way that maybe a straight Superman meant something to you. I mean, for me personally, I know if I had gotten to see a young Superman be openly bisexual as a young bisexual person myself struggling with both my gender identity and sexuality, that would have really helped me out. I'm also a huge Trekkie, and so I'm overjoyed that in the series Star Trek Discovery on the air right now, there is a regular openly non-binary character. And I know that if I had seen that as a kid, when I was falling in love with Star Trek, my favorite franchise, it would have helped me wrestle with my feelings of being trans at that time that led me into feeling a huge amount of depression for a large part of my life. It would have really helped with that. So seeing these characters in these big franchises can make a difference. But even further though, I would even ask you to put yourself in LGBT folks' shoes. LGBT folks and other marginalized groups have always been asked to invest in characters who haven't been themselves. Despite Superman not being me, I still love him. I mean, I have this outfit. I had this outfit before I did this video. I still find him inspiring. I mean, Steve Rogers, Captain America, is my favorite MCU hero. Hell, I mean, even have like right over here, let me just tell you, breaking the fourth wall. Or whatever. Well, I guess I'm talking to the camera. But I mean, anyways, regardless, I have his damn shield. I bought it. I love Captain America. Yeah, you know, like I don't identify with Captain America because he's a straight dude, but I identify with him for other reasons because of his soul, his, his sense of goodness. I still saw him as a role model as a kid. And I'm sure you too can feel that for a bisexual Superman, even if that's not something that matches your identity. So all of that is stuff that I would argue is why I think a bisexual Superman is a good thing. But I also think that there's a conversation to be had, as clearly there is, that one that can be had in good faith. I don't think that there is one right or wrong answer to this, but a conversation. Yet, this is going to start to get us into the darker territory, because as I said, there is a darker side to that guy's argument, the guy who was on Fox News, who we haven't touched. Because he also says this. Why are they sexualizing superheroes? You know, I was a Batman and a Superman, Spider-Man kid. I loved those heroes. We just wanted them to get the bad guys, not a venereal disease. Here he implies that making a character bisexual, making the character part of the LGBTQ community, sexualizes him. Uh, which I have a lot of questions about because what would you call this? Or what would you call this? Or this. You know Superman and Lois are fucking in that bathtub, which, I mean, have you seen Henry Cavill without a shirt on? Hot damn, I'm, I'm there for it. I'm there for it. But we know this is the case with almost every superhero. We know that they have a straight sexuality, that they pursue the opposite sex, and ultimately, usually, they end up boning. So why is that, when it comes to straight superheroes, not considered sexualizing? Well, it goes back to this homophobic idea that to be gay or bisexual or any part of the LGBTQ community really is inherently sexual. It's the same reason why you see protests around kids books that have two princes finding love when no one protests that same exact story of a prince and a princess falling in love in the same exact way. It's because being LGBTQ is often stigmatized as being only sexual, only about fucking, rather than it being what it is for straight folks. It can be a romantic love story, or it can be an explorations of one's identity and how they relate to other genders. And that's something that we see in every single story, whether it's straight or not. So the idea that someone being bisexual inherently sexualizes a character is just homophobic. I would also even ask the question of what's wrong with sexualizing Superman? We've seen him bone Lois. It is a thing that has happened in a major superhero movie. So what's wrong with having a bisexual Superman have sex? The only reason I could think that it would be considered wrong is if someone doesn't want to see gay sex. And I'm not saying you have to seek out gay sex, but to say that you shouldn't have it at all? You shouldn't have a character be able to have, you know, some form of homosexual sex? That seems to come across to me as a homophobic idea. I'm not, again, not saying you have to watch it, you have to like it, or anything like that, but to say it shouldn't happen at all? 
That feels to me homophobic. We even see this guy go even further when he mentions a venereal disease, like, oh, Superman's gonna get a venereal disease because he's now bisexual. That leans into this idea that LGBTQ folks are inherently dirty, diseased, gross, which is deeply dehumanizing, and it echoes a lot of rhetoric that was targeted against the gay community during the AIDS crisis, which disproportionately affected gay folks, who were seen as deserving of their suffering because they were gay. It's honestly just kind of vile that this guy is leaning into that, and very, very homophobic, and the fact that it's on Fox News, one of the biggest news organizations, I find it kind of disgusting, to be honest. And because it was on Fox News, it is now being reflected in spaces talking about a bisexual Superman. And ultimately shows you how widespread this homophobia around bisexual Superman actually is. And it happens a lot with these types of changes to characters. Now that we've dressed with the darker stuff, there are still a few other couple good faith arguments that I wish to engage with here. And I think one person who articulated them well was uh, Superman himself. Dean Cain. Dean Cain was the actor who played Superman in Lois and Clark, who wrote a whole op-ed about bisexual Superman and why he thought bisexual Superman was a bad idea. Now, I'm not particularly a fan of Dean Cain. I'll put that up front. Uh, I think he has said a lot worse things uh, around other topics that I find not great. Let me just, I'll be kind. I'll be kind. I'll be kind here. Don't love Dean Cain. But again, I'm going to be using his words to try to get at why people are making these arguments and why the arguments that he's making might be persuasive to him and might be persuasive to people beyond him. And I'm not here to crap on Dean Cain despite my feelings about him. Um, I'm here to use his words because I think he articulates a certain point of view about this character that I think is enlightening to our conversation. Now in his op-ed, he does mention a few arguments that we've already seen and already touched upon, such as why not create new characters instead of, you know, changing old ones. I also think he leans a little bit into the homophobic angle too, though not as much and not as obviously. But there are two new ideas that I think he brings up in his op-ed that I find interesting that I want to touch upon. And the first is that he argues that DC Comics is just hopping on the bandwagon with making bisexual Superman. It's a chore to keep up with all the different iterations of the current superheroes, but DC Comics is calling it a bold new direction for the character. I see nothing bold about it. I say they're jumping on the bandwagon, but they're fighting the wrong issues. There is a clear agenda here. It's globalist, it's anti-American, but it's not bold and it's not brave. Brave would have been to do some of this 30 years ago. Okay, so a few, again, things that are in that comment. The first part of it is this idea that they're just hopping on the bandwagon is kind of something that we see a lot today. He didn't necessarily use these words, but it's words that we see a lot in conversations around this, that making characters bisexual or black or a person of color or uh, you know gay or anything like that, making a character a woman, that it's all coming from companies just succumbing to woke culture. That it's studios or comic book stores or industries trying to have forced diversity or force their politics into comics to try to make money. You can find this argument pretty much anywhere online. Now there are a lot of things that I take issue with when it comes to this argument of woke culture and I'll just mention a few here, the biggest of which is that having LGBTQ folks or people of marginalized identity in any sort of fiction is not politics. We are people that exist and deserve to be seen in things. It only becomes political because people want to make it political, want to make our identities political. We're not the ones making our identities political, everyone else is. We just want to, you know, be superheroes, like everyone else. Well, number two, it should be stated that politics have always been ingrained in fiction. In pretty much any of the fictions that we're discussing, politics have always been there. Like for example, with Superman, Superman fought the KKK in one comic book decades ago. And it was a storyline that's often cited as one of the main reasons that public views on the KKK changed at the time. Captain America was punching Hitler on the cover of his very first issue. And considering at that time that many folks in America didn't want to enter World War II, nor did everyone agree that Hitler was all that bad of a guy, believe me, there were Americans who did not think Hitler was that bad of a guy, not to mention the fact there was a literal huge Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden around that time. So to have Captain America punching Hitler was a fairly politically obvious statement. These characters and storylines have always been political. I mean, look at something like Star Trek. People are saying that, oh, they're trying to force gay folks into Star Trek, where Star Trek has always been about showing diversity of people. I mean, one of the big things that was hugely hyped in Star Trek, the original series, is that we got to see an Asian man, a black woman, and a Russian dude on the bridge at a time when all those identities were inherently politicized. So politics has always been ingrained as part of these franchises. That's kind of partially why we have fictional stories, to talk about issues today. So this idea that woke culture is trying to force politics into comics kind of feels weird to me because politics have always been in comics. But I actually want to do something surprising here because Dean Cain 
is actually somewhat right in his assessment here. Brave would have been to have a bisexual Superman 30 years ago, most definitely. It would have been incredibly helpful to see a bisexual Superman in the early 90s, especially during the aforementioned AIDS epidemic, to normalize being bisexual, to say it's okay to be bi. He's right, but I wonder why he's implying that it's not okay for there to be a bisexual Superman now. Because it was brave 30 years ago doesn't mean it's not worth still doing today. LGBTQ folks are still fighting for our rights and to be seen as just as normal a way for humans to exist as any other. Certainly, yes, there's some less stigma in some parts of the world around LGBTQ folks than there was 30 years ago, but there is still a lot of stigma around LGBTQ folks. So why is it suddenly not worth doing today? I honestly can't think of a single good reason why not, for all the reasons that I articulated. Rewinding a little bit, we'll get to that in a second. This idea of the bandwagon, the feeding of woke culture by companies like DC, also isn't wrong either. He actually has a good point there. I mean, we see Disney trotting out the first gay character ever in a movie every single year. And it's very clear that the reason that they're trying to do that is to get the publicity points and all the attention for doing it, to help promote their works, to get, you know, the money. That's what corporations do. They do things so they look good, so they can make money. And a lot of corporations have now found out that, you know, showing more diversity can be financially viable. Now, that is performative. It is a performative act. It is a cynical corporate act just trying to get money. 100% true. And many LGBTQ folks can recognize when companies are being performative, when they're just doing something superfluously in order to get the attention, rather than actually putting in the work to being a good ally to the LGBTQ community. But also, two things can be true at the same time. Corporations can be performative, and we can also critique what their limited representations of these characters are, but it doesn't mean that having more representation isn't worth pursuing or that it's bad to have. Bisexual Superman can possibly be a corporate decision made to get brownie points and to get attention to the superhero comic, and it can also still be meaningful to LGBTQ folks looking for representation. It can be both things at the same time. Nothing is ever clearly right or wrong. Nothing is clearly ever good or bad. Nothing is ever clearly so black and white. And because it's not clearly black and white, I don't think the answer is, as Dean Cain tends to imply, is to not to do it. I think the answer is to push the companies to do better with the representation, to be clear with the representation, to not just do it for money, though they'll always do it for money, but to try to push them anyways in that way, and to make more explicit LGBTQ characters. It's not a zero-sum game here. So I would refute a lot of what Dean Cain's arguing there, but Dean Cain has one final argument, is that he calls bisexual Superman anti-American. There is a clear agenda here. It's globalist, it's anti-American, but it's not bold, and it's not brave. Now, this argument I find to be incredibly interesting. Why is making a character bisexual anti-American? Is bisexuality somehow anti-American? Huh. Makes you think. The subtle implication there aside, I'll leave that on the table uh, as just something we can kind of think in our brain. But let's move beyond that to look at what he says a truly brave and truly American superhero would be. Brave would have been to do some of this 30 years ago, or to depict Superman, or John Kent, fighting for the rights of LGBTQ people in Iran, where they'll throw you off a building for the offense of being even suspected of homosexuality. And why doesn't Superman fight the injustices that created the refugees whose deportations he's protesting? Digging deep into those issues, that would be brave. That would be informative. I would read that comic book. Bold would be fighting for the rights of Afghan women to attend school and be able to live free and go to work, and fighting for the right for boys to not be raped by men under the supposedly newly enlightened Taliban. There is genuine evil in the world, actual corruption and government tyranny, plenty of real-world things to fight, like people being put into Chinese concentration camps because of their religion, or human trafficking, honest-to-God slavery taking place all over the world today. It exists, right now, and in our hemisphere. Drug cartels trafficking people around the border, sexually molesting young women. Brave and bold would be to tackle those issues and shine a light into that darkness. I'd love to see the character doing that. I'd read that too. Truth, justice, and the American way is no longer the catchphrase of Superman. The new phrase? Truth, justice, and a better world. Okay, I'll buy that, but what's the vision that accompanies this more expansive view of social justice? What would make for a better world? Socialism? Communism? Forced equality? Whew! Okay, a lot there. So, he argues that we shouldn't have a bisexual Superman, that's not brave, but what he should be doing would be to be doing global interventionism? That that would be brave? Okay, uh, well, I still say a bisexual Superman 
could do all of those things. But secondly, he argues that Superman should be going around as this overt symbol of America, literally going into other countries against their will and putting his own will upon them as an American symbol. Isn't that called imperialism? Isn't that what America has already done all over the world? Go into other countries like Afghanistan and try to, quote, stop the injustices there? I mean, we need to go to protect the Afghan women and fighting the Taliban. That's the reason that we're going into Afghanistan is also, and also take their oil. But also, like, that, that's the reason that we were given that we went into Afghanistan. Yeah. How did that go over again? It's interesting to me that a lot of the things that he mentions, he even mentions there's stuff in our hemisphere, referring back to this idea of like, we're spheres of influence back during the Cold War, that America has a right to have a sphere of influence over certain parts of the world. And for some reason to him, Superman has become an extension of that because he sees Superman as an overt American symbol. Now we'll get to that in a second, but there is already a Superman comic just like the one that he describes. It's called Injustice. It's the one where Superman is the bad guy. In that comic, Superman decides to impose his will and go into other countries to stop what he sees as injustice is being committed. And sure, it makes an objectively safer world under Superman as a tyrant. Kind of again gets the idea of imperialism. Do we have a right to go into other countries to impose our will upon them, to impose our morality upon them. I'm not saying that things that people do to homosexual people in Iran is okay. I'm saying it's a very complicated situation. I'm not trying to argue that it's fine and that it's right and that we shouldn't be trying to do something to stop it, to fight back against it. What I am saying is this version of that, that Dean Cain is trying to place upon Superman is an imperialist one. One that has a lot of implications for you know, seeing America as the strong right way to be. And I think Superman, as a character, has always been overtly aware of that fact, as we see with the Injustice comic. The usage of Superman as an American symbol in that comic is actually apt and correct. But again, it frames the things that he's doing as a bad thing, which it would be to impose his will on other people. Even further, even if we take it down from that huge, huge idea of Superman being an imperialist, I feel like Superman too would recognize that the way that we treat refugees today, forcing them to have to go through human trafficking as a means to get to America for asylum, or sending Haitians who are fleeing a country in poverty that was put into that situation by American imperialism, see some more news, excellent video on that, by the way, back to the horrific squalor we put them in, or putting refugees in cages, I feel like Superman could have something to say about that, but it wouldn't be that America is doing the right thing. And this gets to what I've been kind of alluding to this whole section, and it starts to get into my end point about politicians, because I found the backlash against bisexual Superman to be particularly insightful. Superman in many ways represents a certain kind of view of America that we want to idealize. Superman is a man, despite being an immigrant, who worked his way up from farm boy bootstraps to become one of the most influential people in the world, someone who could use his power in any way that he sees fit. And despite being an immigrant, also looks like the straight, strong, masculine American tough guy. For many people, this idealized view of Superman is how they wish to idealize this perfect American symbol. But he's not. Superman has always been used to critique America. And by the way, Dean Cain does at least mention that America isn't perfect, but he tends to keep circling back to this idea that Superman needs to be this overt American symbol to stand up for American values around the world without realizing that the things that he describes as America not being perfect for are the exact same things that he's saying that Superman should be doing. So I find it interesting that Dean Cain gets upset when Superman becomes bisexual and says that that's anti-American and yet doesn't see the issues with having a Superman go around acting as the imposed will of America around the world because that is seen as American. He gets close to saying that Superman should be a critique of America, but instead he doubles down on Superman becoming a symbol of the America that's always been. And I don't really consider that to be brave or bold either. And at the same time, he subtly implies that being bisexual is anti-American. And that, I think too, is biphobic, is homophobic. To say that being bisexual is inherently anti-American. And it forgets that Superman was never a symbol of America purely and throughly. Yes, he was draped in the ideals of America, and he stood for truth, justice, and the America way, American way, but that Superman has always, always been a criticism of what the American way means. So even if we man of steel all these arguments, I still find it problematic that everyone is upset about a bisexual Superman. I do think there is some validity 
to some of the arguments, as I said before. I get that we should have more characters from the get-go that are LGBTQ women or people of color, but there is value too in telling new stories with new versions of pre-existing characters, and it doesn't always come at the expense of who they used to be. Again, go watch Straight Superman and Lois on the CW right now. Yet this goes even further and goes back to what I was sort of framing this whole issue around. Why are politicians so upset at a bisexual Superman? I mean, certainly there's that political edge that we've been discussing here, the American Superman that he's supposed to represent, that idealized America that he never was anyways, but I think there's more here to it. Because you see, while I understand why Dean Cain has skin in this discussion, he played Superman, why do politicians? Why do increasingly we see so many politicians care about pop culture fights? I mean, we see Fox News platforming that guy, Republican senators, getting in on a discussion. And it's not just about Superman. Increasingly, we see many politicians, Republican politicians specifically, talking about things like Gay Robin or Dr. Seuss being canceled when his books are still freely available or the problem with a transgender, gender fluid Mr. Potato Head for some reason. I mean, there's even legislation starting to be said about this stuff. For example, Florida Senator Marco Rubio proposed a really weird legislation that would have to force businesses to justify their woke business decisions. That's what, that's what the bill said. A very vague term of what woke means. Now, this legislation is patently ridiculous, considering, as we said, the only reason most corporations decide to include diverse characters now, as opposed to 30 years ago, is because now it's safe and profitable. And that's, that's it. Not that it's the right thing to do. I mean, wouldn't that also be enough to justify a woke business decision that it's a right thing to do? But if he's just talking about doing it for profits, there's a profit incentive too. That's why they're doing it. But it even goes beyond senators. I mean, hell, even political talk show hosts are getting on this. Right-wing talk show host Alex Jones appeared in streams with folks like Nerd Roddick, a YouTuber who mostly rants about woke culture and nerd things like Star Trek or Doctor Who or Marvel or things like that. Why is Alex Jones in a nerd YouTuber's video? Why do these politicians and adjacent conversational news personalities and organizations care about such things? Well, it's because they want people to be angry about woke culture ruining America because it distracts from the actual issues. It distracts from actually having to address issues at the border or healthcare reform or more. They'd rather be making bills about pop culture or woke business decisions or similarly, the dangers of trans people who only make up less than 1% of the population of America, as we see in Texas with a recent bill that passed that completely barred trans people from participating in sports. They'd rather focus on that on stuff like that instead of things like the fact that Texas last year had a power grid failure that literally caused people to freeze to death in their homes. So they'd rather talk about trans people, they'd rather talk about pop culture, they'd rather talk about woke business decisions. Because they know if we actually looked at their policies, we'd know that they are actually hard to defend if we paid attention to them. And even further, sadly, we see that this tactic works. For example, the right-wing news organization Breitbart and its founder Steve Bannon back in 2014 used Gamergate, a similar harassment campaign that superficially ranted about wokeness and games journalism that hid sexist and homophobic ideals. He used that to give himself a platform that he used to build up Breitbart and used to get him fame and notoriety. He stoked the anger of these people in order to get himself attention. And it eventually got him a temporary seat in the White House. But even beyond him, numerous politicians, including and up to former President Donald Trump, would rather lean into superficially meaningless culture war topics rather than actually engaging with really important issues. But they'd rather engage with these culture war topics that sometimes have worthwhile points of engagement, but are often, more often, focused on the more sexist, racist, and homophobic viewpoints that lie underneath, as we saw with Bisexual Superman. That's what these people, these politicians, want. A distraction that gets people riled up and angry in their favor, rather than actually talking about real issues. So, this is what I want to leave you with. When we discuss topics like bisexual Superman, I want you to know I truly believe that there is a nuanced, thoughtful conversation to be had. As I tried to show throughout this whole video, I love talking about fiction, and I would love to talk about what Superman becoming bisexual would mean, what it adds to the character, what it removes, the positives and negatives of it the good and the bad, because I don't believe that it's totally good or totally bad. And I'd also love to talk about how that choice helps to inspire and represent people who have often felt underrepresented. And I would love to talk about how corporations can sometimes add this representation performatively, like Disney often does, but how we can often, even within these performative business choices, talk about how these representations still matter, but how they can do better. I truly believe, I truly believe that that conversation can happen as an important one. It's one that I try to bring back up in this video. It's why I spent most of this video on it, to show you that that conversation is depthful. 
is meaningful. But I get frustrated more often that all these conversations get lost in that superficial nonsense just there to intentionally piss people off. So they'll be distracted on important issues and vote for people trying to hold on to power. We're so often ignoring the nuance of these conversations in order to just get angry and anger only benefits people in power. People in power who never use their power to actually help people. Which is what Superman was always about, by the way. A man who had great power, but with it came great responsibility. I know I'm stealing from another superhero there, not Superman, but the same idea applies to him. He's a man with great power, and that is incumbent upon you that he needs to take care of others. And I often feel like the people in power today aren't trying to do that, aren't trying to use their power for others, but for themselves. And how they do that and how they hold on to it is by making people fight each other rather than coming together to work together in the way that Superman has always taught us to do. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching this. I hope this was a good discussion. Like I said, the whole point of this video was to talk about the nuanced aspect of this, to try and take this argument in good faith, and then also talk about how this is being used in that endless cultural war just to stoke uh, politicians nonsense. Uh, and I thought Bisex Superman was a great way to do it because it was nerdy, it was LGBTQ stuff, that's my niche. I love it. So I hope that this video was illuminating that aspect. But if you like conversations like this where we talk about nuance in the nerdy, please subscribe to my channel. I do videos like this all the time where I talk about LGBTQ issues, trans issues, um, other larger social and political issues within nerdums, geekdoms, pop culture to try and talk about those sort of nuanced conversations that's all here on this channel. Don't forget to thank our video sponsor Skillshare as well. That link is down below. Um, and beyond that, I also have a page on pages that you can help support me at. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here. I love you and adore you and I hope that you are staying safe and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Hey there, my patrons, I see you. Thank you for supporting me now. It's October, so I thank you so. I couldn't do this without you. It kind of sounded like Scooby-Doo, right? Anyways, here's your names, patrons. I love you so much. Jem Shin, April Sturk, The Blessed Rain, Sarah Sweeney, Tony the Author 13, Morgan the Pirate Queen, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg, Maas, Kathleen Lambeth, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki, O.D. Casseray, Jetty Indiana Jones, Stephen Clenard, Alex Miller, Ish the Mad, Ramdy Thompson, Wellington Marcus, a man chooses, a slave obeys, Mary Mello Bays, Boyd Earl, April Struck, G Man 42, Joseph Dewey, Chloe Dollar, Felicia Toast, James Cribdell, Elizabeth Christie, Jason, Seven Schuart, Dominic Noble, Aaliyah Kai Gooch, Jessica Wright, Sonia Nero Purdue, Nathiel Froughton, Peter Landers, Jared Johnson, Ferenga Toe, John Steele, Wendy the Bizzle, Celestial Dawn, Barbara Heelchuk, Geek Filter, W. Randy Eady, Pissed and Twisted Garage, John with a B, Eva Kaneva, Meadow Whisperer, Melinda Walters, Ulysses the Pagan, Tiffany Danger, Casual Observer, Lisa, Alex Owen, Beaches Purvis Flynn, Keith Briggs, Manga the Goblin, Emily Loomis, Odd Just Odd, La Mia, William Stewart, Angie Pugh, Jessica Chapman, and Andrew Lamoro, Gretchen Badger, Amanda Ronia Adanya, Sarah Bystam, Laura Demero, Kelesis, Sky Skinner, Fritz Steven, Hieresis, Noble Munch Comics, Jacob Tover, Nathan Steele, Mary Mack, Sarah Sweeney, Jason Knott, Sean Piper, Ship Machine Berlin, Maeve, Andrew K, Polly Mina, Strawberry Pup Tart, Lily, Munir Amlani, Crit Fax, Nikki Gordon, Bloomfield, Chris Overbeck, Michael Hardy, Zone One Librarian, Michael Goaty, Jenny Marble, Pay Steve. Philip Hawkins, Mark Brown, Andy H, Corey and Vale, honking in. Kind of lost the Scooby-Doo of it all, but thank you so much, patrons. I love you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful spooktober. I'm a dork. I'm a dork.